Well, before we dig into Psalm 106, I'd like to make five points crystal clear. Five quick truths that you need to have really crystal clear before we dig into this, this portion of Psalm 106, is, which is, as you can tell, pretty intense. Pretty intense and pretty brutal when it comes to the language that's used. So, six or five simple points. First, abortion is murder. Abortion is murder. It's something we call child sacrifice today is abortion, like we're aborting the pregnancy. All it is is the intentional, premeditated killing of a human being who's still in the womb. We just call it abortion. Abortion is murder, and murder is an egregious sin against both God and neighbor. There's point number one. You have to have that clear. Point number two. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for the most heinous of sins, even the sin of murder. Abortion is murder. Christ died even for the sins of murder. Point three. Therefore, there is forgiveness in Christ even for the egregious and heinous sin of abortion. There is forgiveness in Christ for the sin of abortion. Both David and Paul were guilty of murder in the eyes of God, but found forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Abortion is murder. Christ died even for murderers. So, there is forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ, even for the heinous sin of abortion. So some of you need to realize that if you have participated in, if you have gotten an abortion, you're a murderer. I'm not going to soften that. I'm not going to try to avoid that. You are a murderer. And you need to confess that to God. Turn to Jesus Christ and trust in Him and know that Christ died even to forgive the sin of murder. There is forgiveness for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to soften it because you don't need it softened. You need to hear what you've done is wicked. And Christ can forgive you. Praise God. Don't soften it. Confess it. Go to Christ Jesus and get forgiven of even the sin of murder, just like David and Paul both did. Boys and girls, look up here at me. Children, you need to know that abortion, which is the intentional killing of a child, abortion is murder. And God hates murder. It's a terrible, it's a wicked sin. Abortion's murder. Jesus died on the cross even for wicked sins like murder. And so there is forgiveness, boys and girls, in Jesus Christ for the sin of abortion. You need to know those things are very clear. Adults, don't ever soften the fact that abortion, abortion is murder. Don't need that. Don't soften the fact that abortion is murder. Make clear the fact that Christ died to pay the penalty for even the most heinous of sins, even murder, and there's forgiveness in Christ Jesus for the sin of abortion. Adults, don't ever say, abortion kills people. Don't ever say that. Abortion doesn't kill people. Parents slaughter their own children. It's not abortion that kills people, it's parents. It's women who murder their own children or hire someone else to murder them. So don't act like abortion is just like some thing. No, abortion doesn't kill children. Abortion is murder. And someone else is doing it. And someone else is hiring them to do it. So there's the first three things. It's murder. Christ died even for the sin of murder. So there's forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourth, because Christ can forgive murderers does not mean murder should be legal in our land. Christ can forgive murderers, right? Does that mean it should be legal for me to murder you in our society? You know the answer is no. And so it's the same thing with children in the womb. From the moment of fertilization, this is a human being that deserves equal justice under the law, equal protection by the same homicide code that protects you. So just because Christ can forgive and does forgive murderers who turn to him in faith does not mean that murder, baby murder, 
any kind of murder, should be legal in our society. Neither does it mean that the civil government should not protect the innocent by threatening would-be murderers with severe punishment. Some professed Christians will say, well, Christ is all about mercy, and so women who intentionally murder their children shouldn't be criminalized under the homicide code. We should you know, extend mercy to them and grace to them. Like, well, the church should, absolutely, but the civil government should not. The civil government's job is to protect the innocent by threatening evildoers. And then if the evildoer is not thwarted from their wickedness by being threatened by the civil government, then the civil government's job is to punish them. And they are avenger, an avenger exercising God's wrath on the evildoer, bearing the sword not in vain. So just because Christ offers forgiveness to murderers doesn't mean murder should be legal And it doesn't mean the civil government should refrain from protecting the innocent. And it doesn't mean that the civil government should refrain from punishing the evildoers. That's what God has instituted the civil government to do. Four, or fifth, and finally for my introduction, it is your duty. Look at me in my eyes. Every single one of you, it is your individual duty. As a citizen in this worldly kingdom you're a part of, the United States of America, it's your duty to labor diligently to love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew twenty-two thirty-eight. 38. It is your duty to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Proverbs 31, 8. It is your individual duty to bring justice to the fatherless. Isaiah 1, 17. And it is your individual duty to rescue those being taken away to death. Proverbs 24, 11. Every single one of you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for how you spoke and how you acted in the day in which the Lord placed you in this state, in this nation, that allows babies to be murdered under cover of law seven days a week. Jesus will say, did you not read Proverbs 24, 11? And you'll say, oh, I know that. It says rescue those being taken away to death. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. And Christ will say, did you do it? you say, did you not read Proverbs 31, 8 that says speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves? Oh, yeah, I, I knew that. Did you do it? Did you not read? Have you not read that you were to love your neighbor as yourself and to do unto others as you would have them do to you? Well, absolutely I know that, Christ. We called that the golden rule. I know you didn't call it that, but that's what we termed it. Say, did you do it? Bring justice to the fatherless? Did you do it? You need to know that it is your individual duty as a citizen in this worldly kingdom that we're in to labor diligently to obey the commands of Christ, specifically when it comes to our neighbors who are being carried off to death. Every one of us have a responsibility. Now, getting into Psalm 106, you need to know that this this psalm is really recounting the history of God's people in the Old Testament. You can even see it's a very long psalm. It's recounting the history of God's people in the Old Testament. And verses 37 through 44 are the portion of history of Israel in the Old Testament uh, when they're in the time of the kings. This is in the period of the kings, which you can read in 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. So 37 through 44, think of What's happening, it's after they've been delivered from Egypt. It's after they took Canaan. It's after the period of the judges. It's after David and Saul and Solomon. And it gets into this period of the kings covered in 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Okay, so that's the period this part is dealing with. And as we look at these verses, 37 through 44, this is the doctrine that you and I should learn. And it's 
wonderfully applicable to us in our day, even in the nation and place and time that we live in. Here's the doctrine you should learn from Psalm 106, 37 through 44. When a people pollute the land with innocent blood by allowing the sacrifice of children to idols, the Lord's anger is kindled against them, and the only solution is repentance. When a people pollute the land with innocent blood by allowing the sacrifice of children to idols, the Lord's anger is kindled against them, And the only solution is repentance. So what I want to do in moving through these verses is ask and answer seven questions. Ask and answer seven questions. And if you haven't been able to tell already, this is going to be rather abrasive and rather intense. And I'm intentionally being aggressive. And I'm going to try not to be passive-aggressive at all. I just want to be aggressive-aggressive. I want to be as aggressive as it necessitates me to be. I am a dying man. You are all dying people. I don't mean I'm I'm terminally ill or anything. But I'm a dying man preaching to dying men who all live in a country who are slaughtering children under cover of law with your and my and the whole professed church's overall permission Because we have not stopped it. We live amongst the people who are slaughtering their children under cover of law. And you and I are going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account for how we acted in this time that he put us in. So that's how I'm I'm being as aggressive as I think necessitates or I should be given the situation that we all live in. So seven questions and answers. Question one. What is the condition of the United States of America when it comes to child sacrifice in the 21st century? What is the condition of the United States of America when it comes to child sacrifice in the 21st century? Answer. The condition of the United States of America in the 21st century when it comes to child sacrifice is essentially the same as Israel during the reign of kings in the Old Testament. It's essentially the same as we read in verses 37 and 38 of Psalm 106. We have polluted the land with innocent blood. We have polluted the land with innocent blood. Look at verses 37 and 38 in the 106th Psalm. Look at it in your own Bible So you don't just think, is he just commenting on this? No, look what God says through this psalmist about this period in Israel's history in the Old Testament. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. The land was polluted with blood. Now, who were these demons they sacrificed their children to? Do you see that in verse 37? They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. What is that? Well, look at verse 38 and see that In 37, they're called demons, and then in 38, they're called the idols of Canaan. They're used synonymously. And this is something that you need to properly understand about idols in general and about demons in general. Idols are nothing, and that's repeatedly said in the the scriptures. Idols are nothing, like Molech is an idol. He's He's a bronze statue with his arms out and fire in his belly area, that they would slide children down his arms into the fire to sacrifice to Molech. But Molech is nothing. However, there are demons, as it were, behind Molech that are seducing people and energizing the idea of Molech in people's minds. 
And so that's why even they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. Like, what? Molech's a demon? I thought we were told Molech's nothing. All these idols are nothing. They're just carved images made with hands. Well, there are demons who represent these idols. And so that's what's going on. They sacrificed, you know, the demons they sacrificed to were represented by the same idols God had already warned his people about in Leviticus 18.21. Leviticus 18.21, before God's people go into Canaan to take the promised land, God warns them. He says, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. There are demons behind idols. Demons energizing the idol that is actually Nothing. That's just a front for the demons. So the demons behind the idols of Canaan, they promised the Israelites prosperity, abundance, and peace if they would simply sacrifice their children by passing them through the fire on the arms of this statue called Molech. Why would anyone ever sacrifice their children to demons? because the demons promised them what they wanted. They wanted a better harvest. They wanted more money. They wanted more carnal comfort. They wanted peace. They wanted prosperity. And these demons promised them peace, prosperity, abundance. It's the same exact thing in our day. The demons behind the idols of the USA offers Americans prosperity, abundance, and peace, if we would simply sacrifice our children by discarding them through IVF or starving them through RU486, the abortion pill, or sloughing them off through hormonal birth control and even copper IUDs, vacuuming them out through a suction abortion or butchering them through a dismemberment abortion. The same reason people under the Old Testament would sacrifice their children to demons is the same reason people sacrifice their children to demons today. Because of their career. Because of, I don't want a child right now. It's going to make my life too difficult. I can't take care of this child right now. Which really in the end is, it's going to make my life too hard. So I want abundance. I want prosperity. I want peace. And that's why I'm going to sacrifice my child Ultimately, to the idol of self, on the altar of convenience. You need to see that it's the same demons wearing different cloaks. The same demons behind Molech. The same demons behind the idols that those in the United States are ensnared by. Same demons, different cloaks, same idols, different names. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. There have been well over 60 million reported acts of child sacrifice at abortion clinics alone since 1973. Over 60 million Reported is a key number, and at abortion clinics is another key phrase. Just the ones that are reported, and just the ones that happen at abortion clinics. All of these happened under cover of law, with the approval of your civil magistrates at the state and federal level. And you need to know these numbers aren't even accurate. California has not even reported since the early 2000s. California is the most murderous state in our union, and they've not reported abortion numbers in over 20 years. So the 60 million is kind of a shocking number, but it's probably well over 100. And that's just reported abortions at clinics, at murder mills. Roughly 17 million women in the United States of America are using hormonal birth control and IUDs right now. 17 million women in our nation. Every single hormonal birth control 
and IUDs, even copper IUDs, intrauterine devices, every single one of them has an abortifacient mechanism that leads to the slaughter of children. Every one. You take hormonal birth control, you are risking murdering your child. You have an IUD or a copper IUD even, which is not hormonal, it still has an abortifacient mechanism, which is to say, if a, one or two of the mechanisms don't work, the last thing that it will do is murder your child after fertilization, which is conception. And your doctor will say, copper IUDs aren't abortifacient. Your doctors will say, hormonal birth control is not abortifacient, it just prevents you from getting pregnant. And they're either ignorant or they're lying to you. Pick. They don't know, and so therefore they shouldn't be speaking with authority on the matter, especially as a medical professional that people trust. They don't know, or they're lying to you. So don't trust them if they tell you hormonal birth control does not have an abortifacient mechanism. Levin norgestrel is the most common form of that third mechanism in hormonal birth control. It's also a higher dose of what we call Plan B. Levin Norgestrel, the company that makes it, came out and said, with hormonal birth control, we thought that this third mechanism of action in hormonal birth control, the one that's abortifacient, we thought it rarely happened, and usually the first or second mechanism happened, which prevents fertilization. They said, that's what we thought was happening, and then in a study that they did, they realized that 85% of the time, Pregnancies didn't continue, not because the pregnancy was prevented, but because the abortifacient, the murderous mechanism in the hormonal birth control is the one that was taking effect. 85% of the time, your hormonal birth control is murdering your children. 17 million women are using this in the United States alone right now. Many pastors know this, but are too scared to tell the people in their congregations because they'll freak people out and they'll leave. If I tell you you're murdering your child and you didn't know it and your response is to leave, bye. A response should be, I didn't know that. I don't want to do that. I want to love my children. I want to love Christ. About a million and a half of our neighbors are cryogenically incarcerated right now due to in vitro fertilization. One and a half million of your neighbors, just in our nation alone, are locked in freezers right now. They have made human beings in a petri dish. Fertilization has happened. And then they take them and lock them in a freezer until the parents maybe decide they would like to try to have a child in their own womb. A million and a half. And countless other human beings are made in petri dishes and are slaughtered along the way in IVF, in vitro fertilization. Look at me. For every one baby born through IVF, 30 babies are slaughtered. 30. For every one baby born through IVF, 30 are sacrificed on the altar of self to the idol of biological children. God has providentially closed the womb for many, but some are so determined to have biological children, they're willing to close their eyes while 30 other children are created and slain with dozens others locked in a freezer for years and decades or in perpetuity or until the power goes out at that IVF clinic and all those babies that are locked in the freezers die. As an aside, if God has providentially closed your womb and yet you earnestly desire children as you should, take that as a sign that you should adopt Not that you should do IVF. All of this happens under cover of law. None of it is against the law of the land right now. Though all of it is against God's law. So where are we at as a people? In the United States of America in the 21st century. You could just change one word 
in Psalm 106, 37 through 38, and you'd have to say, yep, nail on the head. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of America. Change one word. And the land was polluted with blood. Right now, friends, America is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. We are the land of the feeble and the home of the butchered. That's the nation you live in. Now, question two. What does the Lord do in response to a people polluting the land with innocent blood? What does the Lord do in response? Look at verses 40 and 41. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations, so that those who hated them ruled over them. Now look at me. I'm not saying the United States of America is synonymous with Old Testament Israel. If any of you think that, get that out of your mind right now. That's not the reality. But what I am saying is 63% of citizens in the United States of America would raise their hand and say, I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and he is my king. 63% profess to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. 42% are Protestant, 21% are Papists. And I know not everybody's converted in there. That's not what I'm saying. But more, a, a significant majority of those who live in our nation say, I belong to Jesus Christ and he is my king. We're a nation dominated by those who profess the name of Christ. And what happens when those who profess Christ allow child sacrifice to happen in the land and even many of them participating in it, maybe not through abortion clinic abortions, but through hormonal birth control and IVF, the Lord had his anger kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage, and he gave them into the hand of the nations so that those who hated them ruled over them. Do you ever think it seems like our civil magistrates hate us? <laughs> Those who rule over us at the federal level, it's like, seems like they hate us. Everything they do, it's like, this seems like what you would do to a people that you hate. Anybody say, yeah, it really seems like that a lot. Why do you think that is? Do you think you deserve better? You think we as a people who are dominated by professed Christians deserve to not be handed over to our enemies and ruled by those who hate us? Seeing that we've allowed our land to be polluted with blood, this is exactly what we deserve. You deserve to have the choice between Donald Trump and Joseph Biden. You deserve that, and so do I. We as a people, we deserve those to be our choices. The conservative guy is the one saying, I think abortion should be allowed up to like 16 weeks. That's the conservative guy that many of you are, plan are planning to vote for. Giving a thumbs up to someone who says, let's allow children to be sacrificed. What does the Lord do in response to a people polluting the land with innocent blood? His anger is kindled against them. He gives them into the hand of the nation so that those who hated them ruled over them. This is exactly what he promised his people that he would do previously in Leviticus 20. This is what he promised he would do if they allowed their children to be slaughtered. If they participated in it or if they didn't stop it when it happened among them. This is what he promised. Leviticus 24 and 5. If the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Molech and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his clan and cut them off from among their people him and all who follow him in whoring after Molech. The Lord promised his judgment on people that close their eyes and allow child sacrifice to happen in their land. He promised his judgment. And that's exactly what happens. And that's what Psalm 106 
is detailing. And that's exactly what is happening in our day. Those who close their eyes and do not labor lawfully to criminalize child sacrifice are promised the judgment of God. Promised the judgment of God. That's what the Lord does in response to a people who pollute the land with innocent blood. Question three. Before we get to what is the answer, what should we do, I want to tell you what the answer is not. What is not needed when a people have polluted the land with innocent blood? What is not needed from you, who I hope are looking at this and examining our culture, looking at the scripture and going, oh yeah, that is us. Like we're in the same place. What do we not need to do? Well, what is not needed is blame shifting. What is not needed is blame shifting. You sitting there, if your immediate thought was the Democrats, blame shift. Or if your next thought, or maybe it wasn't Democrats, maybe you're like, oh, Planned Parenthood and the abortion clinics, blame shift. Or maybe some of you are knowledgeable enough about this issue that you say, it's the pro-life movement who's keeping abortion legal. Blame shift. You don't need to blame shift. I don't need to blame shift. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ in America to confess that child sacrifice continues under cover of law in this land, not in spite of our efforts, but because of our lack of effort. Child sacrifice happens in your nation because of you. Because of you. Because of us collectively as those who profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ says establish justice. Christ says love your neighbor as yourself. Christ says rescue those being taken away to death. Christ says use equal weights and measures. Christ says do not show partiality in judgment. Abortion continues in our land largely because we, as those who bear the name of Christ, have failed to trust and obey God's clear commands in his sufficient scriptures. It is those who bear the name of Christ who are at fault for why abortion is continuing. Do you expect the wicked to abolish child sacrifice? They're not going to do it. That's our job. We are to be salt. We are to be light. We love the Lord Jesus and understand his clear commands and have a desire to obey his commands. And his commands are not ambiguous when it comes to murder and the innocent being slain and our duty towards them. They're not ambiguous. Christians just want to come to church. They don't want to have to talk to their civil government. They don't want to have to go stand on the street. They don't want to have to talk to people about how, you know, the uncomfortable conversation of abortion, child sacrifice, and what God requires of us. Like Adam, many professed believers and pastors love to simply blame shift by talking about how evil abortion is while simply pointing to the Democrats or Planned Parenthood or even the pro-life movement. All those are blame shifts, and none of those are needed. Stop blaming the Democrats for abortion. They are as impotent as the Ammonites and would quickly be overthrown if professed believers repented, trusted, obeyed, and cried out to the Lord. Did the Ammonites have any power under the Old Testament? Or did the only time they oppressed God's people is when God's people were walking in unrepentant sin and God used them to punish them? But what happens when God's people see their sin, confess their apathy, and say, Lord, please deliver us? What happens? He just wipes out their enemies like nothing. Can the Lord not defeat great big enemies with only 300 men? Stop blaming the Democrats. The Democrats aren't the problem. The professed church is the problem. Stop blaming Planned Parenthood or abortion clinics. 
The only authority abortion mills have is what God's people currently allow them to have, just like the priests of Molech in ancient Israel. Go look through and see if the priests of Molech, who would take the children from the parents and put them on the arms of that idol and slide them down through the fire, see if the priests of Molech are highlighted anywhere. They're not highlighted anywhere. The condemnation is put on the parents who bring their children to the priests and the people in the land who allow it to happen. The priests of Molech, Planned Parenthood, abortion clinics, they have no authority. They can't walk around our neighborhoods and murder our children. They murder babies when parents bring them to them and pay them to do it and the society allows it to happen. They only have as much authority as God's people currently allow them to have. That's why Francis Schaeffer, like 50 years ago, said, outside of every abortion clinic should be a sign that says, here by permission of the church. Some of you need to stop blaming the pro-life movement. Pro-life, if you don't know, if you're new to all this, the reason abortion is still legal in conservative states is because of the pro-life movement. That's one of the instrumental causes. The pro-life movement, professed Christians, pro-lifers, they are the ones who have kept abortion legal in at least 15 conservative states. Every time an abolition bill that would simply just apply the homicide code equally to everyone from the moment of fertilization, every time that's put forward, In these conservative states, it's the pro-lifers who actually kill it. So then what happens is people understand that, and then they start just blame-shifting to the pro-life movement. It's like, well, if the pro, if Kristen Hawkins and Lila Rose and all these big people would actually stand up and, you know, try to abolish abortion, it would happen. The reason it's not abolished is these big pro-lifers. You need to realize they are largely to blame as an instrumental cause of killing abolition bills, but don't fall into the trap of just, they're the new boogeyman. Like, it's not Planned Parenthood or the abortion clinics anymore. It's not the Democrats anymore, but those dang pro-lifers. Don't just blame them, expose them. The pro-life movement is largely funded by professed believers, defended by ignorant Christians, and given cover by famous pastors. Don't just blame them, expose them, stop supporting them, stop giving to them. Tell others to abandon the pro-life ship, not because it's sinking, but because it's sailing the opposite direction of faithfulness to Christ. Leave the pro-life movement. Pro-life movement's not going to help you. But you can't use them as your new boogeyman to say, oh, it's them. No, it's us. The church of Jesus Christ has been armed with the Spirit and the Scriptures, and as Christ's soldiers, we are commanded to tear down the high places in order to establish justice. In Leviticus 20, the Lord doesn't condemn the Ammonites. Molech was a false god of the Ammonites. Leviticus 20 doesn't even mention the Ammonites. Leviticus 20 doesn't even mention the priests of Molech. In Leviticus 20, God condemns professed believers who close their eyes and allow their neighbors to be slaughtered. What the church needs is a rediscovery of the power and mission Christ has given us in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. If Christians opened their eyes, spoke like Christ is King, proclaimed Christ's law and gospel crying out to God through prayer, I think abortion would shortly be abolished. So stop acting like your former father Adam by blame shifting. You and I need to act like our Christ by taking responsibility and doing the work of justice and righteousness. Boys and girls, look up here at me. Children. The reason abortion is still legal currently in our country is because, by and large, 
those who profess to belong to Jesus have not stood up, spoke up, and obeyed Christ's commands to rescue those being taken away to death. The reason abortion is still legal is primarily due to the failure of Christ's professed people to be faithful. We do not need blame shifting. It's time for us to say, this happened on our watch. What is needed? Question four, what is most needed when a people have polluted the land with innocent blood? What's most needed is repentance. Repentance is different than course correction. Course correction is just, whoa, I've been doing things wrong. I'm going to start doing things right. That's just course correction. Or acting like, oh, I didn't quite have it right before, but now I'm more refined. That's different. Repentance says, I was wrong. I confess that to God. And then turn from that sin to faith in and obedience to Jesus Christ. We don't need course correction. Don't you dare say, I've always believed that. Don't you dare say that. Like you've never celebrated iniquitous decrees. Like you've never been apathetic when it comes to your neighbors being carried off to death in the womb. What we need is repentance. Look at verse 44. Verse 44 in Psalm 106. Nevertheless, despite all of these iniquities, despite their rebellion and being brought low through their iniquity in verse 43, nevertheless, he, the Lord, looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. This is God's people crying out in repentance. We have done wickedly. We need you to forgive us. We need you to enable us to march forward in obedience. Like Peter preached in Acts 3.19, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repentance is a confessing of and turning from sin to trust in and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Thomas Manton said, whoever delays his repentance does in effect pawn his soul with the devil. What we need is repentance. Not only individually, we need repentance in our entire nation. We need those who profess the name of Christ to admit that this is happening because we have accepted unequal weights and measures. This is happening because we have allowed civil magistrates, we've allowed them to offer us half measures that are actually unjust. We have voted for politicians in the name of the greater good who think it's okay for children to be slaughtered in the womb. Because you swallowed the bait that people said, don't be a single issue voter. You swallowed that bait. If the single issue is child sacrifice, you should absolutely be a single issue voter. You kidding me? I'm talking about the most innocent among us being slaughtered. Meanwhile, many professed Christians keep giving cover and keep giving their votes in the name of the greater good to men who think child sacrifice should be legal. We need repentance. Now, what is repentance? And what does it include? What would it look like for us as a nation, both individuals and collectively, what would it look like to repent of our apathy towards child sacrifice, of our showing partiality and allowing different stages of development to be treated differently and afforded no or different protections? What would repentance look like? Well, Watson, Thomas Watson, has, I think, the best book on repentance. It's a short book. If you haven't read it, you should. And it's just called The Doctrine of Repentance. And in it, Watson says, repentance is a spiritual medicine made up of six 
special ingredients. Sight of sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, shame for sin, hatred for sin, and turning from sin. Sight, sorrow, confession, shame, hatred, turning. Watson says, if any one ingredient is left out, repentance loses its virtue. Let me walk through those quickly. True repentance includes sight of sin. Seeing it, acknowledging it. We as a people have to face the fact that apathy, partiality, or participation in child sacrifice is sin against the thrice holy God. You have to see sin if you're going to repent of it. We have to embrace and face that fact. Apathy, partiality, or participation in child sacrifice is sin against the thrice holy God. True repentance not only includes sight of sin, it includes sorrow for sin. Being sorrowful for the sin that you see and acknowledge. This is godly grief for apathy or partiality or practice in or toward baby murder. True repentance includes confession of sin. Confession of sin. Actually acknowledging it explicitly to the Lord in prayer. Have you confessed your known sin of apathy, partiality, or participation? Or are you acting like your current good works make up for past sin? There are many people who come to understand abortion abolition as opposed to the pro-life movement. And then they just start doing abolitionist type work. But they never confess their apathy or their celebration of partiality or their participation in child sacrifice. You need to confess. True repentance includes confession of sin. Fourth, true repentance includes shame for sin. True shame. Watson says, when the heart has been made black with sin, grace makes the face red with blushing. God shows you grace in Christ Jesus and you're truly repenting of your sin, you will be ashamed. Ashamed of your past sin. Fifth, true repentance includes Hatred for sin. Hatred for sin. He who does not hate the sin of child sacrifice has not repented of his apathy, partiality, or participation in this abomination. If you do not hate the reality that God's image bears in the safest place they should ever be, if you don't hate that, You haven't repented. Can you look at Christ crucified with the eyes of faith and not hate and want to revenge the death of Christ on your sins? Can you possibly see sorrow, confess, shame, and not hate sin? Lastly, Watson says true repentance includes turning from sin. Not only sight, sorrow, confession, shame, and hatred, but it culminates in a turning from sin. It concludes with the turning from sin to God. It's turning from the fleeting pleasures of sin to faith in and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. What we need is repentance in our land. Sight of sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, shame for sin, hatred for sin, and a turning from sin, especially when it comes to child sacrifice. Now, of which sins in particular do we as a people need to repent? Of which sins in particular do we as a people need to repent? You need to know some of these will hit some of you, Some of these may not hit any of you in this room. Some of these may hit every one of you. 
And so that's why I'm phrasing my answers of which sins in particular do we as a people need to repent. I'm phrasing all my answers like this. Some of you, some of you need to repent of this. This doesn't, I know not every one of these applies to every one of you. But I imagine some of these will apply to all of you. Which sins in particular do we as a people need to repent? This should guide your prayers and asking the Lord to grant repentance to we as a people. You want to see abortion abolished, you're going to have to see repentance. Some of you, first, some of you need to repent of sacrificing your children to demons. Whether it be through a a more formal abortion, or plan B, or hormonal birth control, or IUDs, or IVF. Some of you need to repent of sacrificing your children to demons. Some of you need to repent, second, of closing your eyes while your neighbors sacrifice their children to demons. Leviticus 24 and 5 If the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Molech. If they don't establish justice and they, as it were, close their eyes while others in their society are practicing this abomination of child sacrifice, the Lord says, I promise my same judgment on you. The only difference in the judgment For those who sacrifice their children and those who close their eyes while other people is the ones who sacrifice them should get the death penalty and the ones who close their eyes while others sacrifice them don't get the death penalty. But the same language is used for God's face being set against you and cutting you off. Same language, same judgment promised on you. Pro-choicers have both of their eyes scrunched and shut tight. Those who are pro-choice, they they want people to be able to murder children. Apathetic pro-lifers have both of their eyes lightly shut. They're still in the dark. So pro-choicers are like this. Pro-lifers who are apathetic are like this. Still in the dark. They're the kind of people who say, well, I'm personally pro-life, but, you know, I think people should be able to make their own decisions. I think people should be allowed to murder their children. That's an apathetic pro-lifer. These are those who only theoretically are against abortion, but are apathetic when it comes to any real action. Now, active pro-lifers, those who are pro-life and are active, they have one eye shut. One eye shut. They truly do have affection and action for the preborn, but they're showing partiality to the wicked and advocating for half measures and partiality in judgment. They have a zeal, it is true, but not according to knowledge. God demands that both our eyes be opened, not just one. Even in the name of saving as many babies as possible, to support any bill that gives approval to murder can only be done by having one eye closed. For pro-lifers, the eye that would see the baby without a detectable heartbeat or the eye that could see the child conceived in rape is shut to them concerning justice and righteousness. Apathetic abolitionists are also those who have one eye open and one eye shut. Pro-choicers, both clenched. Apathetic pro-lifers, both lightly closed. Uh, Pro-lifers who are serious, one eye closed. Abolitionists who are apathetic, their, their their other eyes closed. Apathetic abolitionists know the truth and yet sit on their hands concerning action. They don't wear out their knees in prayer. Active pro-lifers have their left eye shut. Apathetic abolitionists, their right eye. Active pro-lifers have zeal without knowledge, and apathetic abolitionists have knowledge without zeal. The Lord tells us, open our eyes 
Speak up, act up, rescue those being taken away to death. Are you a pro-choicer with both your eyes shut? Are you an apathetic pro-lifer with both your eyes lightly shut? Are you an active pro-lifer? You really have zeal, but you're okay with iniquitous decrees, one eye shut. Are you an abolitionist, theoretically, but you don't do anything? Then you have another eye shut. Some of you need to repent of closing your eyes while your neighbors sacrifice their children to demons. Some of you, third, need to repent of your participation in or passivity when it comes to in vitro fertilization. IVF. How many of you can just think almost immediately, I know somebody who's done IVF. Did you talk to them? Did you plead with them? Did you tell them the reality of what happens in in vitro fertilization? Or are you just now going, I didn't even know that was a thing. I encourage you to get educated on the issue because your neighbors are being slaughtered by the millions through in vitro fertilization. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Do you want to be murdered if somehow your grade was not high enough? The children they create in the Petri dish, they grade them. And if the grade is not high enough, and they're saying, I don't know if this embryo has a high enough success rate, you know what they do? They throw them away. Do you want to be murdered if you're somehow your grade's not high enough? You want to be locked in a freezer? Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Some of you need to repent of your participation in or passivity when it comes to in vitro fertilization. Fourth, some of you need to repent of your participation in or passivity when it comes to birth control. And I'm not talking about birth control in the sense of you're trying to play God. I'm not even talking about that. That's a separate issue. I'm talking about what both hormonal and even non-hormonal through IUDs, copper IUDs, what this birth control actually does. And it has an abortifacient mechanism in it. If you say, behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Proverbs 24, 12. Leviticus chapters 4 and 5 are clear that even unintentional sins must be atoned for. And if unintentional sins, I didn't know this. If those must be atoned for, then they must be confessed and repented of when you are coming to an acknowledgement of them. Some of you need to repent of your participation in or passivity when it comes to hormonal birth control and other forms of birth control that have, horm- that have abortifacient mechanisms in them. Fifth, some of you need to repent of your apathy just in general toward the fact that children are being sacrificed to demons under cover of law. Many professed believers are just apathetic in general. Amos 6.1 says, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Woe to those who say, I'm saved. I belong to Christ. It's time to kick back and just take it easy. Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Some of you need to repent of your apathy. Sixth, some of you need to repent of sheathing the sword of the Spirit when it comes to fighting this battle against child sacrifice. Don't put the Bible away. Don't just use secular arguments. Don't sheath your sword when the Lord has given it into your hand. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is our offensive weapon as we labor to battle child sacrifice. Don't sheath the sword of the Spirit. Draw it out and swing it. Seventh, some of you need to repent 
of your lack of zeal in petitioning God in prayer. Some of you need to repent of your lack of zeal in petitioning God in prayer. Praying for Him to show His mighty power by abolishing abortion. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Ephesians 6.18 Is that, fathers, look at me. Is that in your list of what you pray for every day in family worship? That God would show His mighty power and abolish abortion. Is that in your list of things you pray for every day as the priest of your home? Are you teaching your wife and your children, if you have them, that this is such an issue that we must continually wear our knees out in the name of Christ as we go to the Father in prayer? And if we will not pray about this, why would God ever grant it to us? If abortion is abolished without the saints wearing out their knees in prayer, then you and I will think that somehow we did it. Some of you need to repent of your lack of zeal in petitioning God in prayer to show His mighty power by abolishing abortion. Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still, and many professed Christians cannot get a sentence in prayer out without inserting the word just. As if God just does anything and is not strong and good. God, would you just... God, would you just... Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and God showed his power by answering that big petition. Sadly, many professed believers rarely petition God to cause repentance and revival so that child sacrifice would be abolished. As Watson said, Christ went more willingly to the cross than we do to the throne of grace. May it not be so moving forward, beloved. Eighth, some of you need to repent of despising the day of small beginnings. Some of you need to repent of despising the day of small beginnings. Zechariah 4.10 says, Do not despise, despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Don't despise the fact that we as abortion abolitionists are still a smaller crowd. Don't despise that. The Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Ninth, some of you need to repent of supporting or giving cover to wicked rulers who frame injustice by statute. Some of you need to repent of supporting or giving cover to wicked rulers who frame injustice by statute. Psalm 94.20 says, Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute? Those who frame injustice by statute are not allied with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are, by their actions, allied with the father of lies who loves children to be sacrificed to demons. How on earth can the righteous be allied with or give cover to the wicked? If their issue is not right on abortion, you shouldn't vote for them. Period. It's child sacrifice. And one of the reasons it continues in our land is because people like you say, we can't be one issue voters in that regard. You know what would probably be really good for the United States of America and would drive us the church, to see how badly we need to repent. It would be really good for that. It's if we have to do four more years of Biden. It would be really bad for the church, recognizing that we need to repent of our apathy when it comes to child sacrifice if we get the economic relief of Trump. You want the church to repent? You know what might need to happen? The church stand up and say, I'm not giving him my vote. And people say, well, what if that means we get four more years of Biden? If that's what it means, maybe that's what we need in order to realize we need to repent and quit supporting people who will allow child sacrifice. Some of you maybe need to repent of your pragmatism. 
It's not going to be pragmatically beneficial if we don't vote for Trump, even though he says babies should be murdered. Give me a break. Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute? Tenth, some of you need to repent of defending or celebrating or even praising God for things he calls iniquitous decrees. If you don't realize it yet, every law that the pro-life movement has ever put forward is something that in God's word he calls an iniquitous decree or an abomination before his eyes. Every single pro-life law that's ever been put forward. Because not one law, bill, has ever been put forward by the pro-life movement that actually establishes equal protection and equal justice for all image bearers. All of them simply regulate when, where, how, and why babies are allowed to be murdered in the name of saving babies. They all frame injustice by statute. And it is the abolition bills that are put forward that actually establish justice in that category and say human beings must be treated equally. You can't allow some to be murdered and protect others. All of them must be treated equally and offered the same protections that even our 14th Amendment requires. The abolition bill gets put forward and the pro-lifers kill it. Some of you need to repent of defending iniquitous decrees or celebrating iniquitous decrees or praising God for iniquitous decrees. When Isaiah 10.1 says, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression. And Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. When people commit child sacrifice, they act as the devil's servants. And when pro-lifers argue for regulating child sacrifice by showing partiality in the name of doing good, they act as the devil's attorneys. Thomas Watson said, when a person commits sin, they act as the devil's servants. When a person defends sin, they act as the devil's attorneys. So piggybacking off Watson, I can say, when a lady murders her child in Idaho, she acts as the devil's servant. And when Doug Wilson defends the law that gave her permission to murder her child, he acts as the devil's attorney. When a lady murders her child in Texas, she acts as the devil's servant. And when Joel Webin defends voting for the magistrate who gave her permission to murder her child, he acts as the devil's attorney. The devil delights in regulating child sacrifice as if it were health care through iniquitous decrees. The devil dances when Christians defend laws that show partiality. The devil loves it when Christians vote for wicked rulers in the name of saving America. Some of you need to repent, 11th, of a pessimistic outlook that led to handing over this nation to the darkness of child sacrifice. Some of you need to repent of a pessimistic outlook that led to handing over this nation to the darkness of child sacrifice. The church dropped the ball. And a large influence, a large thing that led the church to do that is because people swallowed the lie that things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse, or Christians shouldn't be involved in politics, or just keep going. A pessimistic outlook on Christ's lordship over every area of life, or a pessimistic outlook when it comes to what Christ is doing through his church, or a pessimistic outlook on the day of small beginnings. People say, I don't think Christians should be evolved involved in politics. Say, so, okay, well then the wicked are going to make all of the laws. Christians have never believed that. 
until the last 150 years it started sneaking in. Christian said, if we don't make the laws based on the standard of God's word, then all of the laws in the land are going to be unjust. Because it will be the wicked who are making them. And some people have just let it happen and said, well, things are going to get worse. We should expect it. Proverbs 25, 26 says, Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Now what can we do about this? We need to pray. You need to open your mouth to your neighbors about the horrors of child sacrifice in defense of your preborn neighbors. Pray. Wear your knees out in prayer. Open your mouth to your neighbors, to your family. Open your mouth to your magistrates. Who cares if it makes family dinners uncomfortable? Your neighbors are being slaughtered. Pray, open your mouth, especially to your magistrates, your civil authorities. And then third, preach the law and the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to see cities turned upside down from darkness to light, you need to fill your hearts with faith and your lungs with air like Paul did. Proclaim the law of God and the gospel of God and trust the Lord with results. We need those who are not yet converted to get saved and those who are already converted to repent of their apathy when it comes to child sacrifice. So pray, speak up about the horrors of abortion, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no sin that's a match for his grace, no rebel that Christ cannot redeem. There are no lawbreakers that Jesus cannot make law keepers, and there is no place on earth he will not conquer. So go forward with his law and gospel and faith and trust the Lord with the timing. Beloved, we have to be a people who can stand before the Lord Jesus and say, I labored to be faithful in the time you put me in. And the time the Lord put you in is a day when children are slaughtered seven days a week under cover of law. Do not grow weary in doing good. We will reap if we do not give up. Pray with me. Our Father, we ask you for the grace of repentance. We ask you to grant repentance to us individually, to us as a state, to us as a nation, to this world. Grant repentance. So that we would love our neighbors as ourselves. We ask you to abolish abortion. Show your mighty arm. Show your power and strength. By abolishing legalized child sacrifice. For your glory. Enable us to be faithful in this generation. This time you've put us in. Thank you for sending Christ into the world to save sinners like us. Please save those who are not yet converted and sanctify those of us who are. Strengthen us to be faithful for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.